very much, uh, Mike. Thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me all right at the back with the mic? Uh, if, if you think about uh, the general situation that we're in, at a very broad level, it, it seems to me that there's kind of two quite striking and apparently contradictory uh, features that you could use to characterize some of the things that are happening. On the one hand, at the level of big global trends, uh, there's a kind of sort of almost irresistible slide towards disaster in multiple ways. And, and the slide has the form of something that's uh, almost compulsive or addictive. You know, that we're addicted to consumerism, we're addicted to uh, energy consumption and uh, all kinds of environmental problems that result from this. We're, we seem to be addicted to austerity now, to rising levels of inequality, you know, the, the kinds of trends that characterize the daily news and seem to be coming more and more intense and more and more irresistible and that are structured broadly by, by the way that uh, global capitalism operates and works and there's no reason to, to suppose that that will change I think in the short term and that uh, it attempts to sort of see a way out of that through catastrophe or so that the acceleration of these trends to a kind of breaking point does seem like a real council of despair it seems to me. Um, so you have that on the one hand. On the other hand, you have actors who, who, who operate with a really quite extraordinary brazen levels of impunity. You know, Israel bombing Gaza repeatedly, or bankers who bank up the economy and then engineer a bailout uh, with the most extraordinary uh, uh, levels of, um, of indifference to popular demands and extraordinary levels of, of arrogance. Uh, or the, the trade agreements that are being pushed through now, for example, that are finally getting some attention in the press, but the Transatlantic uh, Trade Investment Partnership or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, these, these kinds of really just almost like overt pushes that corporate interests are driving through to cripple the powers of so-called sovereign states. And, and these things are happening at, at, at a level that is more and more open, flagrant, brazen, and so you have this combination then of kind of apparently irresistible, compulsive global trends, <coughs> major actors operating with, with, with impunity, and what's striking is the lack of substantial popular response. I mean, there is some, and I'm going to come to this, it's certainly, a, that's a very wide generalization, but on balance, if you think about, for example, something that affects all of us, the way that tuition fees were ramped up here, the way the system has essentially been privatized from underneath us, the higher education system, in, in the space of you know, almost no time at all, and, on, uh, and without the slightest case to be made for it, simply as an opportunity. You know, they saw the opportunity, and they converted what was a, a very good public system into something that is now just a, a standard neoliberal cash cow. And there was resistance, certainly. I'm sure many of you were involved with that. But considering what was going on, it was inadequate, small, ephemeral, half-hearted, and certainly didn't succeed. And so in that context, I think we need to, we need to rethink what it is to talk about collective capacity. And this, the title I gave for today, Willing and Able, really wants to make, I want to make one main point, which is that a theory of the will, in my opinion at least, can provide a good account of, of a political response <coughs> that combines things like purpose, deliberation, informed discussion and debate, as well as uh, the capacity to drive decisions through and to make them into a reality. So that, just at, the, at a very general level, you try and think about what the difference between will and wish is. You know, in French, you use the same verb, vouloir, you can translate it either way. Uh, you can also throw in whim, the idea of, uh, kind of I, a lot of the debates in the, in the analytical literature on free will, and there's a vast industry uh, behind that, is in fact, I think it would be better to describe it as question of free whim. You know, to what extent am I free to do some whimsical thing like raise my arm? And this is the kind of thing that actually they talk about in the Get up from my chair, you know, kind of pick what, whatever tiny thing it is. Uh, and that's, there are questions about that. To what extent is it determined or not? Is it compatible, or compatible with forms of determination? But they, what is circumscribed in, the, in the, the frankly trivial domain of whim is one thing. Uh, the domain of wish is another, so we can have aspirations, utopian ideals, uh, we can dream about certain things, but wish as a concept and as a practice is not constitutively connected to the, to the manner of its realization. So 
you can connect them. You could have a theory of wish fulfillment, for example, that informs certain kinds of psychic practices and so on, dreams and, and such. But and you could have an account of concrete utopias, the way Bloch, for example, develops it, which can prepare the way to something like the realization of a dream, to build something that might eventually realize it. But you can perfectly well talk about wishes that are not at all connected to the way you might realize it. And that, I think, is in fact the normal thing, the, the dreams that people have, which are in fact uh, just aspirations, but nothing more than that. The concept of the will, though, I think, does involve, at the basic level of what the, you know, what the concept means as we normally use it, it does involve at least the capacity to realize your will. So in the classic sovereign case of, you know, the, the will of the sovereign is such and such, and, the, and for it to be a command, a plausible command, to be, to be convertible into law, it, it does require at least the capacity of the sovereign to institute that as a law, for it to become, <coughs> for the, the, the sovereign will to express itself as autonomy, as, as uh, autonomous legislating power. Um, and even if, in fact, it's thwarted or the actualization of that capacity fails at some point or doesn't manage to overcome the obstacles, it does, I think, at least involve, in principle, that capacity. And then it's a struggle. Then it's a matter of, well, does it, is the capacity strong enough to overcome the resistance to that capacity or not? And it's useful, I think, to frame it in those terms of capacity versus counter-capacity, resistance versus you know, capacity to overcome resistance and so on. And once you put it in those terms, I think, certain things become uh, clearer. So I think it's a, it's a useful notion, and we can anchor it in a very broad history that does link will and capacity in this way. You can think about, just, just briefly, you can think about, say, Kant and his concept of Vermögen, of, of, of faculty or capacity, of power, precisely, and there's an elaborate account of Kant of different capacities that we have. Uh, and, uh, and it's essentially an account of our powers. What, what can reason do? What can our imagination do? What can our senses do? And what are the limits of those capacities? And how might you engage with those limits and perhaps think, think beyond them? And in particular for Kant, of course, what matters is our practical capacity. So reason for Kant is fundamentally a practical uh, capacity. And it's essentially one that expresses itself insofar as it expresses itself in the world we live in, in the form of will. And so Kant's moral theories essentially, as far as we practice it in this world, and not merely as a as noumenal beings in a, in a kind of other sphere, it's a, it's a theory of will, essentially. Uh, Hegel's political philosophy is also a theory of will, essentially. That's how he introduces this uh, principle of philosophy of, of, of right. And his theory of the state is essentially a theory of the institutionalization of a collective will. Um, uh, Marx is a little trickier, but there's a tradition, I think, through the Marxian and through the, the immediate uh, people that follow Marx, Lenin, Luxembourg, Gramsci in particular, where again, the category of the will is fundamental. So in Gramsci, Gramsci will go so far as to say that the will is essentially uh, the object of political philosophy, and it is, should be our primary uh, concern. But the root of all of this, I think, is in Rousseau. And Rousseau, then, the, the, most, the most famous theory of political will, the notion of a general will, a volonté générale. Uh, and Rousseau, I think, is the, the most important reference and there's a lot to get out of Rousseau, and I'm not going to give you a kind of scholastic uh, account of Rousseau here, but a couple of points just to bear in mind. One is that Rousseau insists, and he talks about it as a, as a dogma or as a principle of faith, that, that the principle of every action, he says, is in the will of a free being. You know, and without will, there is no action. And there is no refuting it in practice. He says, I don't have a good theoretical account of what this capacity is, a free will. I don't know, I can't prove to you that I even have it. It's like it's very anticipates Kant in a sense. I, I can't know that I'm free, but I don't need to know it because I just I can just act freely and the action is sufficient. And to prove that it's sufficient, I will go ahead and do it. I can do it at the personal level, but of course what can I do as a person? Well not very much. He says a free person does uh, the, I'll give you the French in phrase actually l'homme vraiment libre, so the, the truly free person ne veut que ce qu'il peut et fait ce qu'il lui plaît. So the, the truly free person <coughs> wants or only wants or wills what he or she can do and does what pleases him or her. So you, you, the, what the point here is that vouloir and pouvoir, willing and doing, are connected and in both directions. The truly free person wants or wills to do what they can and vice versa, they can do what they will. 
And those two things are not fixed in advance, but they can grow. They mutually reinforce each other. And the process that Rousseau talks about in this characteristically blunt way of growing up, and a lot of Rousseau's work is about growing up, educating at the level of a person, the individual, Emile, and a lot of his own reflections on how he grew up and what, what the different stages of him becoming an adult, if you like, reaching the age of reason, uh, what, what that involved. And more importantly, at the, at the level of society, what is it for a society to effectively to grow up and to appropriate its own capacity, to emerge from bondage or tutelage, again, anticipating a Kantian motif, and to acquire its own capacity to become autonomous and to legislate for itself. And uh, so the point is that this capacity, you're doing and willing, is not fixed. It, it evolves. And so at a very but banal level, what can an infant do and will? Rousseau said, very little. What can a child do and will? Very little. But, uh, but you can grow up, and you can, as an individual, you can become more and more capable, more and more powerful at the level of action and at the level of willing. But as an individual, still, you can do very little. And the point is that you can generalize that will, you can associate with other people, combine with other people, and your collective capacity is on a totally different scale. And the scale is, in fact, set precisely by your capacity to generalize. So the, this word general in volonté générale is very important as a verb. The question is, how far can you generalize your collective capacity? And it happens that Rousseau, and I'm sure you'll, you'll know this, or if you, if you remember vaguely Rousseau, you know that he talks often about anachronistic city-states, Sparta, Rome, uh, little, small communities, Geneva is important where he grows up. It's a model for him for at least a, a certain period. Uh, but, but that's just a contingent historical, you know, his, his own historical imagination is rather limited. <coughs> And, uh, but Rome, after all, was not exactly a small place, and its capacity to generalize a certain uh, collective will was, in fact, very remarkably large. And he talks also about the Jewish diaspora, for example, in his political fragments as a good example of a general will that held itself together, that managed to generalize across all kinds of obstacles, including physical, geographical ones, endless persecution, all, all kinds of uh, uh, challenges and obstacles that would otherwise have fragmented and dispersed, degeneralized, if you like, particularized the, the will of those uh, of the Jewish people, and that the story of the Jewish general will was the story of all the practices that allowed it to hold itself together across uh, space and time. Uh, and there's no reason, I think, to, uh, to think that in another context, Rousseau would have seen, for example, the, something like what Marx talks about as the proletari as proletarianization of cross-national boundaries. So then you could arrive at a slogan like the workers of the world unite or one big union or something like that as again precisely a work of generalization, not a kind of facile, immediate universalization of a position, but the step-by-step -step laborious construction of a common interest across obstacles, across boundaries, across all the tendencies that otherwise would divide and disperse people. And he says, it's a, it's a sad and unfortunate fact, he says, uh, that the, the League of the Stronger, as he puts it, is the more natural one. The elite will always be organized, will always be coherent. You see it today, for example, uh, unprecedented levels of integration of global corporate elites. Again, those transatlantic and trans-Pacific trade deals that I, was, uh, that I mentioned before are a good example of this. Uh, and, but that, that's, you know, the, the rich organize themselves. They organize themselves, they form natural cliques, they have their connections and networks, that's what they do, that's how they maintain their position. The poor, though, the people, ordinary people, have to build these things. You only generalize, you only generalize your capacity insofar as you artificially institutionalize it through practices, and he uses the archaic term of virtue for that. What is virtue? Virtue is all the practices that allow you to put the common and collective interest above the factional, class, family, particular, private, personal interest. And that's it, and they can take all kinds of different forms. Again, in Rousseau, they happen to be broadly patriotic forms, but in principle, it could be any kind of form, a trade union, a political party, an international movement. Um, I'm going to end this talk, I'll come to it soon enough with the, the Spanish example of the Podemos party or Podemos organization as a pretty good example, I think, of what Rousseau was talking about. Um, uh, so uh, that, uh, that's, in a sense, what Rousseau uh, offers, I think. And uh, that, I think, is also the, the core of, the, of the, what, what is a living in the Jacobin tradition, and perhaps Michael talked about this I won't go into it now, but Robespierre is a very interesting case of somebody who says that the rev what can the revolution do? What are we capable of? 
essentially we're capable of what we how of how far we can maintain a common collective virtue in very much this Rousseau East sense. Uh, and then the tradition that that picks up from him that goes to someone like Blanqui, and Blanqui is somebody who uh, I've been doing some work on lately, who I think is a very underappreciated and marginalized figure. Uh, some of you may know him, some of you I imagine you may not, but Blanqui spelled B-L-A-N for November Q-U-I, uh, was a very significant and important figure, anticipated much of what Marx says uh, in Blanqui's work of the 1830s. And uh, although Marx and Engels had many differences from Blanqui and their arguments were, uh, were lively in the London exile circles uh, where there were a lot of Blanqui supporters, they had a lot of things in common too. And some of the most politically intense work that Marx and Engels do is, is when they are close to Blanqui, which is to say between 1848 and 1850, that peaks maybe with the March 1850 address to the Communist League, which is essentially a league of Blanquist and Marxist and to some extent some Proudhonist um, activists. And then again around the Paris Commune, 1871, which is in very largely a, a creature of the Blanquist, or at least in, in large part of Blanquist activists. Uh, and Marx, again, supports them very strongly. And just parenthetically, one of the unfortunate things I think about recent work on Marx, uh, and some of this goes back to at least the, the 1970s, has been an attempt to divorce Marx from Blanqui and that tradition of revolutionary action, direct revolutionary action. Blanqui says, it's straight out of Rousseau, almost he says, nous le pouvons si nous le voulons. We can do it if we will it, basically. And the whole question is, how, what, what do you have to do for that to become a reality? What is it to actually take power and to keep power? And Blanqui spent his life experimenting around that question and coming up with some rather reckless answers to it. Um, <coughs> but it's an important part of this story. Uh, and by emphasizing this conjunction of willing and uh, doing, or w will and capacity, or willing and able, I think we can avoid, uh, and I'll just mention it briefly, some of the unfortunate tendencies to polarize uh, theories of practice and theories of practical action, which schematically go either Hegel or Kant. You know, with Kant, you have a very appealing and uh, uncompromising account of freedom that says freedom can, that, you know, there are no limits to what freedom can do, and only free action discovers its limits by doing it. Uh, and there are really, in this, for example, the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals is a really very inspiring account of what freedom is capable of. And essentially, it's capable of whatever it sets itself to do. But it, that capacity remains, though, in a sense of full, a, a kind of otherworldly capacity, capacity that can't easily actualize itself. The question of how you know that an action in the world is free or not remains a very vexed one for Kant. And sometimes he will say that you can't know it at all. Maybe there's never been a single free action in the world. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, Hegel gives you quite a fleshed out account of how uh, freedom is actualized, and in a sense his philosophy is nothing other than that. But it, the actualization of freedom proceeds in such a way that it becomes indistinguishable from necessity, and that the institutionalization and actualization of freedom in the Hegelian framework is essentially one that uh, manages, I think, to unite freedom and necessity in a way that ultimately only favors necessity or fra favors a freedom that is an absolute freedom, essentially the freedom of something like a god or god-like subject. Uh, and that is a kind of impasse, I think, uh, and that we need instead to think about will and capacity in, t in terms of its actuality, precisely. Uh, and this, uh, and, uh, Mike mentioned, uh, there's part of that article, if you haven't read it, that surveys quickly some of the some contemporary tendencies in, in philosophy, so this will of the people article that was circulated. And I'll just add a couple more because the list is really almost <coughs> infinitely expandable. You could, uh, you, know, you could add figure after figure uh, in contemporary philosophy uh, of, of people who try either to, to uh, sidestep the question of the will or to dissociate it from its relation to capacity or simply to bracket it altogether. And I'll just mention a couple of people. Take, for example, uh, Derrida's, one of Derrida's last books uh, in his, uh, published in his lifetime, the book of Why New Rogues say on political reason. And that, if you look at that book, or if you, if you know it, you'll remember, the, sec the second part of it is divided into two essays, and the second one is shorter. And it's about as good, it's one of the last pieces that I wrote, it. it's kind of a kind of testament, I think, that summarizes many of his concerns. And what's really striking about it there is he says, what we need to do 
separate the domain of the unconditional, by which he means something like the domain of the ethical, the domain of the imperative, the domain of what really matters, you know, unconditional importance, from the entire sphere of capacity, from the I can, the je peux, the, and everything associated with it, which for him means ipseity, sovereignty, uh, freedom as autonomy, which for him also clearly has a section on Rousseau as well as Carl Schmitt and the usual uh, figures that go along with that. Um, and his precise his effort then culminates with precisely this attempt to dissociate the two, whereas it's usually sovereignty that thinks of itself in terms of the unconditional and self-founding and so on. Yeah, he tries to divorce them. And what it leaves you with is an account then of the unconditional that is precisely dissociated from any account of capacity, which is to say that if an account of the unconditional, the account then that would frame the ethical, and you'll know that Derrida had these very strong and forceful claims about, well, what hospitality involves or forgiveness, or, uh, how to relate to the other, and so on. But in ways that are now positive without any uh, reference to how you might actually go about making these things realities in the world. Um, and he emphasizes that. Right? Likewise, uh, Quentin, and likewise, similarly, uh, Quentin uh, Mea Sue's book, After Finitude, which is certainly a very popular book in my program among students. I don't know if it's a big, is this something that people read here, by the way? Is it uh, kind of a big one? I'm old. I mean, I think, by the way, it's a brilliantly written book, and very compelling, but I'm puzzled in a sense by why it has such a, an appeal. Maybe it's something you can explain to me afterwards. But one of the things that's striking about that book, too, is that it comes up with an account, briefly, about how anything is possible in a certain sense. So all of the, you know, all the natural laws that hold the world together, that have made things thus, that, that, that lend a certain stability to the way things appear, that all of those things can change, and they can change, and this is the key thing, they can change for no reason. There is no reason for things to be as they are, or for them to change. And therefore, they can change. But the possibility of their changing is divorced and divorced emphatically from any account of the actuality of that process. In other words, the capacities, for example, that people might have to develop or acquire in order to make things change. Now, that's partly because it's not his concern in that book particularly to address that. But what he wants to do is develop an account of possibility divorced from capacity. And again, I find that an intriguing move and a very problematic one. And intriguing that it would become, that it would resonate uh, at such a deep level with a lot of people today. And perhaps it's a reflection of how hard it is that, uh, for us now to think of our capacities, right? and even to pose the question of what we're capable of. Um, I'll just mention a couple of other names. Uh, Agamben's recent work, his uh, last lectures that I've read, at least the last couple of year or two, have emphasized what he calls a destituent power. So, and the power precisely to refuse actualization, to remain at the level of pure potential or impotential, as he puts it, to withdraw into a kind of the a sort of political equivalent of limbo, which is an important motif for Agamben. And again, you'll get references to you know, quite a wide range of uh, people that are sometimes close to Agamben, like Tikkun and the Invisible Committee, uh, or Theory Communist, other accounts of communization, which again will uh, almost make it a point of pride to emphasize the gap between the, the process of communization and an account that would consolidate a capacity, let's say the capacity of a class, the capacity of a party, these kinds of old fashioned notions, uh, in favor of something that is much more either spontaneous or self organizing or uh, catastrophist or that proceeds on the basis of some other kind of process or perhaps on the basis of no process. And I'll just mention a, a three other people and then, I, then I'll you know, move to a slightly different motif and, 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 and move to a conclusion. Uh, three other people who even, uh, the, the people who did think about capacity very much and who debated it in very lively terms were the people who were infused by Maoism in, in the late 60s, at least in the French context that, I'm, that I tend to work on. So students of Althusser in the late 60s, already by 1966, a lot of them, most of the, some of the most interesting ones, were already forming uh, quite an interesting young, a, a group of, uh, of, of Maoists, um, basically Maoist political uh, action group in the Ecole Normale, very small thing to begin with. Uh, and as, uh, over the next year and a half or so, into May 68, they become increasingly radical. And after May 68, there's some soul searching and uh, all kinds of debates and schisms, and then different Maoist groups emerge. Uh, the most famous is Gauche Politalienne, but there's several others. And three of the in fact, many of the uh, thinkers that I think are most interesting today 
were really shaped one way or another by that moment. And Rancière and Badiou are the two most famous. But I would add another who's not at all as famous, uh, uh, called Guy Lardreau. And if you just think about these three people, uh, Rancière, uh, Badiou, and Lardreau. So Lardreau, I imagine most people have not read, but has anybody read any Lardreau here, out of curiosity? One or two people probably, but. No, OK. He, he died a few years ago, 2008 or 9, I think. Um, and he, he wrote a book that was probably, yeah. at the time, it's called The Golden Monkey, Le Singe d'Or. It was probably the most interesting, most widely read book in that gauche proletarian uh, uh, sub-world, if you like, of the Maoist fashions. And he wrote a book that was a bit of a bestseller uh, after that called Lange, The Angel, with Christian Jean Bay. So it got a sort of a cult status. And I'd recommend that you, if you can read French, that you have a look at these books. They're quite curious and quite interesting. Um, but these three, these three characters, uh, Badiou, Rancière, uh, Largeau, have in common that they, didn't, they never reneged on their principles. So they, these are people who remain committed to radical equality, popular justice, the legitimacy of popular revolt. Uh, and uh, and, they, and you know, they go very far, I think, in their affirmations of these points. But what's, what's interesting about them is that all of them, I think, find ways of affirming that and holding true to those principles while detaching them one way or another from questions of organization and the constitution of a collective capacity. That do be the one where it's the hardest argument to make. But if you think about Rancière, Rancière, very strongly Maoist in the early 70s, and right? his first book, uh, Althusser's Lesson, it was a sharp critique of Althusser's scientism and sort of elitism on classically Maoist principles, Maoist grounds. Larger, larger was exactly the same thing around the same time. And then Rancière, confronted with the dissolution of the Maoist moment, you know, uh, uh, it happens over a period of years, but uh, rather than just give up on it, like most of the Maoists did, most of them shift often to the exact opposite side of the political spectrum and become very conservative, Rancière holds to his principles, but has to find people who uh, illustrate them or maintain them somewhere else, which is to say back in the 1830s and 40s, where he can affirm popular actors and const, you know, theories of the people and theories of popular emancipation that are broadly in line with his account of equality and, uh, and that uh, that allows him to continue, if you like. Um, in other words, he maintains a certain Maoist project by, by, de, by de-actualizing it in the historical present and by finding another moment in history to locate it. And Badiou uh, persists much more, I think, uh, emphatically in the project of political organization, and he, in fact, devotes much of his energy to that. But also, as time goes on, and he, he persists in thinking that Maoism is the moment of the organization of victory through to 1977-78, anyway, uh, and attacks anybody who's, who loses faith and so on. He's very um, abrasive in some of his criticisms in those years. But as time goes on, he starts to dissociate his account of equality and justice and so on from something like the movement of history. And that as the movement of history becomes harder and harder to understand in terms of imminent victory, he then detaches his account of politics from historical mediation, at least in a conventional sense. And his account of political organization becomes increasingly uh, uh, detached from broader institutional forms, like the form of the party. So he emphasizes how what he calls now political organization is an organization without party, and at a distance from the state and dissociated from, in, in a sense, the Gramscian notion of a, the building a hegemony or a historical block or a capacity to form your own state, something like that, to appropriate the state, to direct the state, which parenthetically is a very much a Rousseauist project. Rousseau says the government is always a problem, but you need, you need some kind of government. The question is, can you control it or not? What do you have to do collectively as a people to control your government and to maintain it as the servant of the people rather than the master of the people? And uh, Gramsci's project is broadly in line with that. And Badiou's instead becomes increasingly then an account of <coughs> micro-political organization, which can only really survive and maintain its coherence because it remains marginal. Uh, Badiou, for example, will defend notions of noyau, of little clusters or knots of people, cells of people in factories and so on, uh, but we, and which can operate with great integrity and so on, but because they remain very small. And that if, if things had proceeded slightly differently and if these noyau had become big, if they'd become if they'd acquired mass memberships and so on, they would have faced, I think, some of the same kinds of problems that trade unions tend to face when they reach a certain scale. Uh, and they would have had to start to address some of the international problems that, of course, decimated organized labor uh, over the last couple of decades. 
And value, in a sense, has dodged those questions, I think, uh, by insisting instead on this kind of microscopic account of organization. And finally, Largeau, well, Largeau is not so familiar a point of reference, but very strident emphasis on his uh, on uh, Mao's principles of equality and revolt. And what happens with him is he maintains them in a purely spiritual domain. So that from the late 70s, what happens is he reorients his work away from direct political action into the domain of, in fact, early Christian spirituality and some other uh, forms of uncompromising ethical imperatives, also with Kant and so on. So you have, in each of these three people who hold to, true to their principles, you have a kind of decoupling of the principles of equality and justice from, again, an account of actual capacity, and also an account of the will. This is not a term that any one of the, apart from a gunman, sorry, apart from a larger in terms of a, a very strongly numinal Kant, uh, they, they all have an aversion to the notion of will as capacity. So what would it mean then, and I'll just sketch this out fairly quickly, and that the article that you read, or that, that you may read, uh, if you come to it next week, uh, consists largely of a, of a list of dimensions, of things that a political will would have to deal with if it was to hold itself up. And I'll, I'll summarize that in a sense by reducing them to four, and say that if we were to talk about or, or renew some notion of collective will as capacity, uh, there are four things that such a, such a will has to do in order to sustain itself. Uh, and they're pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, the first is that it needs a, a capacity for association and assembly. It's a way of finding some way of combining itself. And again, Rousseau is a fundamental on this. He says, essentially, that you can find a nice quote, for example, in Social Contract, in Book 3, uh, Chapter 8. He says, popular power is like, um, like gunpowder, he says. Uh, you can either combine it into something that will power a weapon, or it can be scattered around, and such that it says, if, if, if it, the gunpowder just scattered across on the ground, it, and it goes off you know, grain by grain, then it has no effect and has no power. And that, therefore, fundamental political division is between a strategy uh, that pacifies and disempowers people by spreading them out, by scattering them, you find recipes for this in Aristotle, right through to Tocqueville and to contemporary accounts of a lot of what I think neoliberal globalization is, is the management of dispersal, dispersion. And Harvey's work and other people I think help understand this. Um, you have that on the one hand, and then you have on the, op the opposite, of course, then some account of well, how to concentrate and consolidate your forces in a city, for example, or in a neighborhood, or in a place, or in a factory, or in a, in, in, in a combination, an industrial combination and trade union. Uh, and one of the reasons that makes Blanqui so interesting is that he thinks in terms of the city. The city is the key actor, not because Paris and Paris is the city for Blanqui, not because of some metropolitan privilege or you know, special insight that a city has as if, uh, as if it's, um, as if it's just kind of this essence of metropolitan existence, but because a city enables this assembly and association, enables this concentration of collective capacities that simply isn't possible in the countryside. Broadly, Marx makes the same point in relation to France, if you know his 18th Brumaire. He says, a peasant, you know, what's the difference between a proletariat and a peasantry? Well, the peasantry is scattered around the countryside like a sack of potatoes, he says. Each small farmer living side by side with another small farmer doing roughly the same kinds of work, and living in such a way that they don't combine, they don't come together, they don't pool their forces. And therefore, they can't represent themselves, they can't constitute themselves as a class, they have to be represented by some you know, magisterial figure, a kind of Louis Napoleon or something like that. Uh, whereas the proletariat is precisely that thing, that, that class, which, whose very existence, whose very form of work and so on, tends, other things being equal, tends, Marx believed at least, to be concentrated in its place of work and to be increasingly integrated and coordinated. I think Marx, though, is part of the problem, and Marx, he over, he's too optimistic, I think, the, the necessity of that process and the, the, the way that that process would work, the linear, irresistible force uh, of industrialization that would, in some sense, suffice to ground the self-organization of the proletariat. And, and you find that to some extent also in Lenin, I think. Uh, so that's the first thing. And, and you, without going into big examples here, you could think of uh, something like the spread of the development of the Jacobin clubs, so and maybe this is something that came up before. A really remarkable example, I think, of, of a, the invention of a form of association which, which allowed for and, and, uh, and the development of, uh, of 
a, both a very local and, and centralized capacity for uh, coordinating responses to political events and so on. Another that I, would, that I would mention is the development of uh, small churches, little church groups in, in, at the time when liberation theology was powerful and important in Latin America in places like Brazil. But particularly the, uh, the, the example that I'm familiar with in, in Haiti, the so-called Pilegnes, little churches, that, uh, that might sound innocuous now, I suppose. But if you know something about history, they were very powerful and, in fact, by far the most important form of organization and, and association in the days leading up to the election of Aristide um, in 1990. Uh, and just think about it for a moment. A country like Haiti, uh, in, the, in the Caribbean, very poor, the very few places where people could meet, very few places where people could associate and assemble, and in particular, very few ways in which local assemblies could coordinate at a level, you know, at a, at a regional, let alone national, let alone international level. And the major exception to that was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church does have little places where you could meet. It has all kinds of private resources. It has them in every parish or every part of the country, and it has them all over the continent and indeed all over the world. And therefore, the, the appropriation of the Catholic Church, in fact, the conversion of the Catholic Church from an institution that had been a bastion of the establishment in Haiti all the way through, they supported Duvalier, they were, you know, arch reactionary in the 1950s and 60s. And by the, by the early 80s, they were, they, they had largely been hijacked by people who were strong believers in Marx and absolute equality, the notion that the poor are indeed the incarnation of God on earth, uh, you know, these very trenchant, uncompromising principles of social justice that we need now and so on, and backed up with tremendous courage, and they were the single biggest threat that the United States, for example, saw in the hemisphere, much more so than organized communism and so on, which at that point was already a bit of a, a, a sort of declining force. Uh, and so, the, the, and why? Well, in large part because it enabled people to come together, simply that, then discuss things in a free, relatively free, uninhibited context. It also allowed priests to get up in something like Egil and Port-au-Prince and speak freely, relatively freely at least, and say things like Vatan Satan, you know, I actually at one point basically tells uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier, the dictator of the day, to go to hell in the church at a time when people are being disappeared routinely and so on. So it's a, it was, I think, a very important um, uh, moment in, in, in the history of, of Latin America, and it's also one that was then very heavily repressed. So, the, you know, the, the counter-revolution, if you like, in the Catholic Church, with Ratzinger and JG2 and company, the development, the massive mobilization of a counter-movement counter in the evangelical churches and so on. That was in part to destroy these uh, these degrees, and they've been very successful. There's very little left of them. Now you have lots and lots of little fragmented demobilizing evangelical churches all over Haiti, handing out free food and, uh, and so on. So that's a, a first thing. You, you, know what, you need some, some way of combining people, allowing people to come together, to associate, to assemble. And of course, we're developing all kinds of new ways of doing that. But the second is that with that capacity, you need also uh, a capacity for deliberation and discussion that is relatively freely informed. So you need media, you need ways of educating ourselves and people overcoming the distractions and deceptions and so on that otherwise divide people. And so that would be, that would be another motif to develop and to look at, for example, our accounts of education, what's at stake in education. Um, how far we can reappropriate education from this, in the way it's been absorbed into the neoliberal project. A third thing would be then for those things to combine in something that is more organized and directed, that, is, that has a capacity for leadership and concentration that can arrive at decisions, and that such that those decisions can indeed be, be, uh, be sovereign and impose themselves as, in principle, determinants. So if you think there about uh, the way that, say, Marx begins to think about a party, what is a party? You know, the, the term party is very loose. In fact, Marx never really defines it. He talks about it in different ways. But he says in the Communist Manifesto, the party, you know, broadly, it's, it, the, what sets the communists apart from the movement as a whole is not that they have a sort of sectarian special interest, uh, it's that they represent a movement in its generality, as a whole, in its international dimension, but also that they are the people who, are, who can put themselves out in front, who will take the risks of being in the vanguard, and that's something that means the term, but who are the most resolute and most advanced, who have had the time to clarify the line and to mark, as he puts it. And then we'll endlessly think about this motif of a vanguard, not though as something that's separate from the, you know, the rest of the army, but simply the people who are the leading edge, the people who are likely to get shot, 
first when they go into combat. People who can direct, to some extent, um, something that is more massive. <coughs> uh, and so how to think about that um, in an adequate way. <coughs> and I would prefer I, I, to work there on, on the question of Lenin, I'm not going to go into it here, but work that I think it's really helped to recontextualize Lenin and to, and to read him in a, in a way that, is, that makes, in fact, it's not, it's not explicit, but really makes it easy to connect Lenin to this tradition of, essentially, this voluntarist tradition of will and capacity. It's work by Lars Lee, L-I-H, which I recommend you. A big, important book on Lenin's What is to be Done, called Lenin Rediscovered, which is one of the more remarkable books I've read in the last few years. And I'll give it as quickly the example, a more contemporary example of Bodin, as I said, that I, I would just at least refer to them. And I imagine many of you here, some of you will know a lot more about it than me. And many of you probably have been following this in the last year. But it was founded about a year ago, about a year and two days ago, I think. Um, and so this is a Spanish party. There, there is, it has been for a long time, an established, broadly, you know, former, con still communist party and associated United Left group in Spain, which polls at around 5%, has done for quite a long time. And it's not been growing, uh, even you know, in the last few years when Spain has been under all kinds of pressure. I'm sure you know the levels of unemployment, the evictions, you know, the real social disaster that has been unfolding there. So after the Indignados movement, the 15 May movement, 2011, where, by the way, so this huge, a very powerful expression of popular discontent and indignation, one of the slogans, though, of those days was El Pueblo Unido, you know, the, united, the people united do not need a party. We don't need parties. We are enough. We, we suffice. Here we are. And, uh, you know, that's a nice slogan. It's a nice way to start. So maybe Occupy a Square and hold it for a while. But, of course, after that, that, that's a good way to start, not a good way to continue or to end, I think. And that, of course, you do need something like a party or a form that can give actuality to a collective you know, a collective will, if you like. And the question is, what kind of form? What kind of form will be, will be flexible enough, will be responsive enough, will be grassroots enough, while also having the capacity to win an election, for example, to take power and to keep it? And this is what Podemos has been uh, trying to do. So I'll just, I'll just mention a couple things about So if you're not familiar with them, it is a, you know, it is a remarkable story. Um, I'm sure many of you, again, this might be completely unnecessary, and there's lots of stuff online and in their websites and other places. But it was founded then a year ago. Uh, it's now polling at either the, the most popular or very close to the most popular party in Spain. Uh, they have you know, a point or two either side of the Socialist Party. Uh, and if there was an election tomorrow, there would be a very good chance that they would win. And, and this is a pretty unprecedented thing. Um, they, they, their membership, you know, they, they, they opened it up for membership in August 2014. They had 100,000 members in the space of a day or two. Uh, and that has trebled since then. So the rate of increase is really very impressive. It's now at 315,000 <coughs> counting. Uh, and the way that they're organized is really very remarkable. I, I do encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, I'll just mention very quickly a few things about it. One thing, so the term Podemos, which means what we can, and it's precisely done the whole question about capacity. What is our capacity? What are we capable of? And it's framed very much in terms of popular will, will of the people, and so on. Uh, they don't uh, emphasize Rousseau, but they certainly talk about Gramsci and Gemini, La Clau is an important point of reference. Um, some of the leading figures here, including the leading figure of Echo Pablo Iglesias, are all sort of adjunct academics. In fact, they're very, they do the kinds of things that the people in this room largely do, I imagine. So teaching classes and political theory or film and so on. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's, it's quite remarkable to see then people like basically grad students at uh, the forefront of a political movement like this. Um, so that's the first thing. They emphasize very much capacity. What are we capable of doing? And we, and in a sense, in the very classical Russo sense, you don't know what you're capable of until you find out, until you experiment, until you test what the limits are. That capacity is grounded. They call it their constituent process. Grounded in what they in circles, so local cells, you like our circles that are very flexible and fluid, and they can take all kinds of different forms. The leadership positions in them rotate, they respond to the kinds of things that Marx talks about, again, following Rousseau, in relation to the Paris Commune, so all the positions are elected, and that nobody can last for more than a year or so, they tend to be, they tend to rotate around. Uh, note this, they refuse in principle the idea that political representatives should have uh, higher levels of pay than anybody else, so they're European the members of the European Parliament, for example, only accept a third of the salary, and so on, it says some, perhaps, but nonetheless it says something. 
And these circles are designed to spread and to increase, so they're precisely not trying just to talk to the converted, just to preach to the far left, if you like, even though that's very much in substance. That if you look at what their manifesto is about, it's essentially a little indistinguishable from, uh, let's say, a very progressive social democrat or broadly in line with, say, the Communist Party manifestos in France and uh, Spain. Um, but they're designed to win over people, so they don't emphasize division uh, and you know, immediate nationalization or workerism so much as unity, a kind of patriotic internationalism. And they talk about the popular interests against la casta. They have new slogans that are very like that of the 1% and so on, particularly the establishment. Um, and it's these circles that generate the, uh, the, the the principles that they want to uh, campaign on. So uh, everybody can vote. It's a, they use social media in a very inventive way. Their like, Congress they had in October, so the first major party Congress, had all the members uh, vote, and they vote online to see what are our priorities, what are our, the five main things that we're going to push forward. And as you expect, there are things like you know, maintaining free public education, ending immediately evictions of people, ending um, all the moves towards privatization, you know, repossessing the, in a sense, the, nat the national good, and so on, <coughs> anti-corruption, and a whole list of very progressive uh, principles. Um, and I'll just, um, it, that, so that, that side is, in a sense, very oriented towards the grassroots, to the local participation, and so on. But it's corrected, and I think importantly, by a kind of democratic centralism, if you like. Uh, that again in October during their Congress, there was a, a big debate, a divisive one, <coughs> about whether the, the party should be organized in a very pluralistic form with three leaders, broadly with you know, different, so it, a, a divided leadership, if you like, and very much emphasizing its localism, or whether there should be a single coordinated leadership with a single uh, head figure, like a, like a conventional political party. And it was that position that won out by, by quite a large majority. Precisely because, and this is what he said, Pablo Iglesias, the, the current leader, he says, you don't, in quoting Marx, he says, heaven is not stormed by consensus, it's taken by assault. And we need then the capacity to take power by assault, essentially by democratic assault, and to keep it. And we are here, he says, we're here to win, we're here to form a government, to maintain it, to emphasize the importance of institutional power, administrative power, and so on. And again, these are, I think, important principles to kind of ground political practice. And then the final thing about Podemos that's important and obvious, but is its explicit internationalism. So Podemos is a patriotic party in many ways, but one <coughs> that overtly and explicitly takes its inspiration from what's been happening in Latin America, from the Bolivarian sequence, and some of their key uh, figures, for example, their, their, their main election strategist, Eze Hong, uh, did his PhD on the Bolivar, on Morales and the, the movement for socialism in Bolivia, so the anti-neoliberal campaign in Bolivia, that is, uh, I think, probably the most remarkable political sequence of the last 15 years. Uh, he's, he worked in, in, uh, in, in Venezuela for some time, and it's very much oriented then by what can we learn from this? What is this mobilization of popular power in Bolivia? For all the obvious differences, how can we, in a certain sense, take some inspiration from that, find our own way of, of, uh, of mobilizing popular power in that same sense? And, in doing that, but then converting a we can into a kind of we will. This is what we're capable of. This is what we are now going, uh, going to do. And that's precisely what they're in the process of doing. So the final thing that I would mention, and I said that the, the, there are four aspects of, of political will or collective will. as capacity, a capacity for association and assembly, capacity for deliberation and discussion, capacity for organization towards decisive leadership. And the final thing, then, is the capacity to impose that and to make it a reality, to make a decision uh, into something that can be instituted in the face of whatever resistance it might encounter. To will the end is indeed to will the means to that end, as any number of people have said, not just Nietzsche and so on, but also Gramsci, Lenin, and Trotsky. And that, I think, is then a, a further essential point. And what does that mean uh, for us today? The, the classic motif for that was always the question for the Jacobins, for example, was the question of what is it to arm the people so as to overcome the resistance of the state, to overcome the resistance of the, 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 of the elite. Today, I think that motif, the literal motif is, is de passé, but the question is not. And the question of what is it for us to find our own political arms, so to speak, so that we can overcome the resistance that we face is indeed, I think, the burning question that we need to answer and to address.
talking about actually the fact that you just stepped off a flight from Berlin you know, to deliver a, a, a paper as, as inspiring and as good as that. It's, uh, it's in itself quite extraordinary. I mean, I, um, I'm actually left with many, many um, questions that I would like to pose, but I'm, I'm going to just maybe start with one. Um, it was, you know, like I say, it's very inspiring. It's very, it's particularly inspiring to hear uh, a kind of very comprehensive theoretical, historically grounded account that, that nonetheless deals so concretely with um, a kind of current political reality like the Demos. And obviously, the, you know, your account of that is very inspiring. That does make um, this question of capacity feel very um, thrilling and very real. Um, one thing, though, that I, I felt maybe was not so present in the talk, but was more in the paper, was the, this question of, um, of, of discipline, as it were, the kind of flip side of the, um, the imposing of the decision, of the imposing of consensus onto the, the political collective. And I, and I want to pose it as in a kind of devil's advocate way, in a, slightly, in a way to slightly connect, to connect back to Michael's talk last term, because in a way, in, the, in your essay, there's a I would say maybe a kind of qualified defense of the guillotine, which is a kind of qualified defense of the necessity in certain situations for um, discipline to be imposed violently on those who do not agree with the decision that's been democratically allowed by them. Could you, could you speak to that? To the, um, and, you know, I don't know if there's, a, a, again, an example of, for example, of Podemos or, or another kind of contemporary political organization. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll start with a Take the case of Bolivia. So in, in Bolivia, uh, is this Mike Silver? Yeah. Uh, you, re you remember the, there was um, one of the, the key initial moments in the, in the Bolivian sequence was the so-called Cochabamba Water Wars in 2000. Uh, and just to remind you, I'm sure this is familiar for many of you, but uh, you know neoliberalism had gone very far in Bolivia, and Bechtel had been given a contract to basically privatize, you know, a private. Uh, a contract to deliver water services in Cochabamba that went so far as to be able to say that they owned the water that people collected off the roofs of their houses. You know? So that you have to pay a fee to Bechtel and their local associate uh, for you know, just appropriating the water from the sky. You know? and, and this finally did provoke a major backlash. And there was lots of discussion. There's traditional forms in Bolivia uh, called AILU, of, of people, you know, of, of a format in which people will come together and basically talk through what should be done until you reach a decision. It doesn't have to be a complete consensus, but you talk it through. And the, you know, I, I went to Bolivia in 2007, talked to people who were you know, not, not in the field of research, but heard a little bit about how these things work. And at a certain point, you reach a consensus, and then the decision is taken. And at that point, you are bound by the decision. So for example, the decision was taken to confront, uh, to confront the situation and to blockade a road, which would provoke a police response, and then to stand down the police. And that was an irrevocable decision in the sense that once that decision was taken, people were committed to that, and you did not have the right to back out. And some people I spoke to anyway said that occasionally some people would try to back out, and we would burn their house down. Because if they backed out, and if that became a, it's a bit like when you go on strike, you know, and actually people don't show up on the picket line. I imagine some people here have had this experience. Then your strike is decimated, and you're left hanging and dangling. And they said, we've decided. We thought about this for weeks, for months. And now we're in. And your choice is now to come with us or to leave. And you have no other choice. And that, I think, there's a, a ruthlessness to that, if you like. And it's absolutely necessary if you're going to win a fight like that. If you don't have that determination, then, you're, then you lose. You're certainly going to lose in the face of what's coming. And that's the point that Trotsky makes in a very similar context. And it's very much a point that Jacobins made. Once it became clear that what they were dealing with was a civil war. So the guillotine is not defensible in terms of some horrific process whereby the, the revolution consumes its own children and so on. It's defensible as a way of limiting the damage of civil war. And that's what happened. The French Revolution, I mean, often we have this idea of the French Revolution and all oh, started very nicely and there, were the, there was a sort of a, a, okay, there was a crowd that stormed the Bastille, but otherwise it was like a big, you know, outpouring of, of popular enlightened opinion and the old order decided they would sacrifice some feudal institutions and then and everything was very nice, and then somehow or other these ruthless you know, autocrats got hold of the thing and it all became a nightmare. That's not at all what happened. What actually happened, broadly anyway, in my view, was that a big mobilization of popular power, which indeed took the Bastille, and more importantly, marched on Versailles, a really important moment in the French Revolution is October 89, 
when there's a march on that side and people burst right into Marie Antoinette's bedroom and terrify the woman, that's for sure. And, um, and, she, and this is a really a thing that's hard to imagine. Before 1789, the idea that that could happen. Um, and they bring them back. They take the baker and the baker boy and so on back, as they put it, back, back. They take the king and the Dauphin and the family back to Paris. And at that point, the king is essentially a prisoner of the people. And then you have a fight. Then you have basically um, two years or so when the government does everything possible to resist what it's been forced to do. In other words, to resist the actual implementation of the abolition of feudalism. They impose martial law. They drag their feet on this and that. They, they, they find every way of thwarting in fact, what people have extracted by force, essentially. So that two years on, the king is conspiring and plotting with uh, all of the reactionary heads of Europe, and there's a full-scale civil war going on in much of the countryside, pitched battles between landlords and local magnates and revolutionary groups who are, again, trying to push these things through. And, uh, and what happens in the, over the course of 1791 is that that battle becomes uh, really very acute. And it looks like the government is increasingly siding with the reactionary forces. And the dominant ministers and so on are broadly monarchists and, and so on. And the revolution is pushed onto the back foot, uh, right up to the point when the king actually you know, uh, tries to leave France so as to be able to lead a war, of, a counter-revolutionary war. And that, but that is thwarted. And then you have, then it becomes much more violent. And the guillotine is basically a way of limiting what would have otherwise turn into a really awful civil war. I mean, it becomes awful anyway. But you, you might know the, sep the, the September massacres of 1792. So that's you know, gone in another year. The popular forces have basically mobilized themselves to the position where they're strong enough to now to defeat the king, etc. Uh, and a, a large number of, of aristocrats and so-called counter-revolutionaries, and many of them, I think, that's a good description of them, have been put in prison, but not been dealt with in a sense. They haven't been sentenced. They're just piling up into the prisons. And, and, and it's an awful event in many ways. But, but rumors spread, and there's talk of, you know, the Prussians are marching now. France is at war with half of Europe. The city, the, the Prussians are saying, we're going to burn Paris to the ground. And you have this fifth column in your city. And the people of Paris organize themselves to take matters into their own hands, make butcher, like a thousand. 1,500 of these people. Uh, very methodically, it's quite a grisly business. Over two days, they just take them out of the prisons and kill them one after the other. And, and that takes everybody's breath away, surely. Um, and the guillotine is essentially a way of making sure that doesn't happen again, because I, I mean, they, that becomes the polarizing issue, is that either you say that is a horror, like the people of Paris are indeed a mob, a menace, they have to be, you know, we need the police, we need to restore order, which is basically two thirds of the assembly probably takes out position. And Robespierre and Marat and the others say, no, that we, we let this happen. It's our responsibility. We should have made sure that things didn't get to such a desperate point. We've, let it, we've basically been irresponsible. And we must now do what is necessary to, to basically lend something like collective discipline to a very legitimate popular fear and a sense that uh, the revolution is being betrayed and it's not being sufficiently implemented. And essentially, the guillotine is that. And it starts out in a you know, fairly disciplined way. The process, I think that it would be important to say that the early use of the guillotine essentially as a way of containing a, the potential for bloodbath was legitimate. And, and that's not the same process as Robespierre's reckless attempt later to destroy the factions, basically to decapitate the different wings of the opposition in early 1794, so two, two years on. And that does indeed backfire very badly. And it was a terrible strategy. And, you know, but, it's so very nice to rewrite history after the fact, right? But that, that's different. That's not, um, not the same thing. And that, there, there, I would say, that is just an exercise in, in uh, itself in, in, in factionalism. And uh, in the law, precisely at that point, too, uh, the Jacobins become increasingly distant from popular, direct articulation of popular power. And that's been described in detail by a, a, a lot of people, um, by Sobul in particular. And, and that was a tragedy. Uh, and it reflects Robespierre and company's limitations and so on. The, the person who went furthest, though, in that direction was Maha. And Maha is someone who really deserves to be read much more than he, than he is. Because Ma Maha is not interested in the machinations in Parliament. He's interested in the mobilization of popular power. And saying to people, wake up, look what's going on. And, and he says that from the beginning, by the way. He says, I mean, the, the guilty is very much Maha's enthusiasm in a slightly sinister way, but he, he says, Right from you know the get-go, already in the autumn of 89, he says, you're being betrayed. All these things that were promised are not going to happen. You're just going to be 
you, gotta, you think that these guys who ruled us you know, for centuries are going to just give up their power because we asked them to? You know, are you kidding? You know, it's not going to happen. And he's absolutely right. He predicts out again and again and again what's actually going to happen. And his answer is probably the same, which is we need to mobilize popular power in Paris, in the sections that Paris has created. You need to do this in a very concrete way, and you need to force it through. And he's, he makes a very good case for it. I'd love to follow up, but I really, um, I really want to make sure this um, chance all the questions that I know about there. Um, who would like the mic? Uh, my question is going to take us like, a little bit off track, but I'm really interested in how I'm doing about it right now. I do have vibrant matter, and I'm wondering how you relate that to your theory. So I wrote my question because it's wrong. Um, so it, when you talk about Rousseau and claiming that um, we can't determine what to find through will, however, I know I, I have it because I can do, how would you relate that will with agency? Because if we look at agency as the ability to make change, can we not look can we not look at things like electricity or energy as having the ability to make change and therefore under Rousseau having will? For example, during the power crisis of 20, 2003, electricity freely decided to travel backward, greatly affecting the grid, which played a major role in the breakdown. And eventually, um, many, many uh, entire states backed out of the northeastern grid, which was a huge political move in the deregulation and deprivatization of energy a very political change, simultaneously proving that human agency could not prevent electrical, electrical agency, making the electricity not a context for will, but the agent of will itself. If we include the mobilization of thingness, how does, the effect, how does it affect your view of the necessity for human will to assemble in order to make change? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I suppose my, I, what I wonder is whether you're using, we're using the words in the same sense. So whether when you say agency and decision and free and will and so on, whether we mean the same thing. <coughs> um, that, you know, that evolution or that, you know, natural or biological processes change things. That's clearly the case. But that, that, um, that material forces have a capacity for decision is much less obvious to me. Um, and that the way I would talk about decision then is not just a, a, some, a capacity for something to, to, to abruptly become different, um, but actually to involve, in fact, the things that I listed. So, it's, for example, a capacity for deliberation, to weigh up possibilities and to reason a way towards a decision that is indeed an exercise in practical reasoning. You know? And I don't see how uh, you can do that without, without precisely that faculty, to use Kant's term, that capacity for a reason. And I don't see that material things have that, except perhaps by analogy. But is reasoning necessary for the argument that you're making, which is that for change to occur, we have to assemble, we have to push things through. And in fact, reasoning ends up often reasoning us out of making that kind of, to being that dedicated to the cause. And often out of fear, we back out or we, we, we leave the cause. But in fact, objects and thingness, which have the will to do things out without consideration of context end up making more change because they lack reason. Well, if, if, if by reason you mean sort of sitting back in an armchair and thinking, oh, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, that's not what, say, the Kantian tradition means. Though. Reason in Kant is totally fearless. And it does, it, to, reasoning is to, to reason to what is the right thing to do no matter what the consequences are. And for example, Kant will say, you should always tell the truth. And you tell the truth, even that means that your head will be chopped off as a result immediately, or that your family will be tortured and killed. Or, uh, that, in other words, it's utterly uncompromising reason uh, in that sense. And it would be for Rousseau, too. For example, for him, the exercise of collective reason often involves sacrifice, a great deal of sacrifice. In fact. So it wouldn't be a recipe for caution. Uh, on the contrary, it would be a recipe for simply doing what is right. So practical reason and doing what is right are kind of well, very tightly connected in this tradition. Um, the difference is, though, between something like, uh, I think, fun, you know, what is the most basic way of distinguishing will from not will, or the voluntary from the involuntary in the classical tradition is to say that, that uh, the involuntary, at least in the, in the domain of human action and behavior, can take the form of a reflex type action, something impulsive, something that precisely doesn't proceed through a process of reasoning. But you know, I, like a, you shine a light in my eye, and the people will you know, contract, or I'll have all kinds of reflexes, right? Which are which are useful things, and that are handy in a crisis in particular. 
But they are, I think it's reckless to assume that reflexes will solve our problems. And that, in fact, what we're up against is much too big for that. What we need is, in fact, a mass exercise of reason, which would, which would accomplish a great deal, I think. And that, that's a capacity that we need to cultivate. There's a danger, then, I think, for maybe in the background of your question, I, I, one of the other things that I think I could list as being hostile to rather than inclusive of the will, like the way you're putting it is we could expand the, the, our conception of the will right, to include material things. But generally speaking, optic oriented philosophy, for example, as I understand it, which I haven't read that much of it, I have to admit, um, isn't really interested in that so much, or seems to downplay it, or the actor network stuff, by, by blurring the boundaries between human and non-human agency, doesn't seem to me, you know, generally speaking, the political implications of that don't, don't seem to me very progressive on balance. Instead, it's more a way of saying, well, we have to negotiate with all these other forces and, and stop, you know, abandon the hubris that we might have that we could in the Marxian tradition sort of control nature. You find this very strongly in Marx, that we can master nature, dominate nature. And it doesn't mean that we can, it's a recipe for rape and pillage, but it is a recipe for saying that we can, that we have no, in a sense, um, we're in a position where there's no way, there's a way around the fact that our relation to nature is exceptional. And that we either use it in a way that is utterly destructive, the way capitalism is, for example, or we plan it out, we think about it, we reason it, and we consciously arrive at how, for example, we should live in this nature so we don't destroy it, for example, so that we can share it equally, so that we can, so that we can respect it, etc. But that is a matter of freely and deliberately thinking it through and deciding to do so, and arriving in a social situation where, where that would become possible and not just a pipe dream. Here and then Michael. <coughs> yes, hello. I'm struck by your your use of this word capacity as opposed to faculty. Um, so Kant Kant's often described as talking about the, the faculty of imagination, not the capacity of imagination. And, um, and at the end of your talk, you you said, "Well, we need to arm ourselves," which was a, an an explicit uh, invocation of, of embodiment in some sense, but. This word capacity, I, to me, invites us to think about the effects of, of a particular kind of uh, um, actualization and, and not the source of that actualization, whereas faculty tends to draw you back to what is the actual source of uh, an imagination or what the source of something. So I'm curious about if that, and this seems to be a move that Rancière also makes when he talks about uh, capacity for equality without ever really addressing how that's actually Actualize. Does, uh, what resources are there available to actualize quality? So I'm wondering why, if, if the difference between these two words matters, and, and uh, if, if by using capacity we're continuing along a Ranciarian idea of proposing <coughs> collectivism or pr proposing equality without really addressing concretely what resources we might draw on to, to achieve that. I guess. Yeah. Thank you. I well, I think that precisely the effort is to think them together. And then, in fact, the term capacity, will, by willing and able, um, in that sense, um, where familiar is one term in the Kant tradition, but you also have the notion of power, cast or something. And in Kant, in Kant they, I think he's, he's often trying to think them together. What, what, is, the, what is this capacity that we have? Um, uh, no, how can it how can it actually uh, operate? You know what, and, and the will is the and he's not, for, for example, you'll you'll insist that well the ground of that capacity of reason, for example, is essentially unknowable. We can't we can't we're, we're just too limited. Our minds are wired in such a way that we can't address that question. We can pose it, but we, all we can know is we can't know the answer to it. And uh, and Kant's very circumscribed about how it how it does that, what its effects are in fact in the world, and that I think is a limitation precisely. Kant's philosophy. Hegel goes the other way, as I said. The question is, can you take them together? And I, there, I think the tradition of, let's say, Marx's conception of labor capacity, labor power, the capacity to labor, the Arbeitsvermögen, right? Also, Arbeitskraft, and he often uses the terms more or less interchangeably. And it's well, one of the things that's productive about that is, is that also our capacity to work under capitalism is commodified entirely. So the, the capacity to work is the thing that labor sells, right? It's the commodity that is the root of the whole system. And that's all that, in a sense, it can be under capitalism. 
Uh, and so you can make an account rate, while Stone and others do, to say that labor power uh, under capitalism simply is a commodity, and that's it, end of story. It doesn't have a physiological dimension, or it doesn't have a, a natural excess over that. But in, in Marx himself, I think, there is clearly also an account of how you would reappropriate that capacity so that it exceeds capitalism. It obviously existed before capitalism, too. So that you can talk about the reign of freedom and human capacity as capacity for self-determination that would reappropriate itself from its alienation under capital. And that, in other words, would then be a capacity that did have effects in a free society. And the, and the, the question is, how then do you make that capacity, which is own is in a sense are rather obscure, into the active principle of society such that it actualizes itself in freedom, would be the revolutionary process. You know, that's exactly what, that's what political practice would do. And so it's not an easy, it's not like, oh, OK, there's an easy answer to it. And the problem with Rancière is that he doesn't really address that. He doesn't want to address it. Uh, and instead, he posits it as a useful axiom and says that if you read things this way, we can see more and so on. But he does not want to, I think, meddle really with the practice that this would involve. And it, my suspicion for that, but my, I think why, why that's the case, is that he was so, he found that those early years in the 1970s, the early 1970s, a very dispiriting and difficult period. And he doesn't want to go back into it. And I, I, on one level, of course, I understand that. But, that is the problem we have, I think. And people like Polemos, every situation is different. You couldn't possibly just copy it uh, here for all kinds of reasons. But to find some way of doing that, I think that's our task. Uh, it, it was very striking that you used the word resistance in your last uh, sentence. But it was the resistance of as it were, the powers that be, or the yes. elite, or whatever, to the will of the collective will, or will of the people, uh, to uh, actualize itself, to realize itself, yeah. and and that's at a time when um, resistance is used a lot, as it were, on the other side, resistance to power, and in the economic and technological and global conditions that we're in, the conditions that you mentioned in a sense at the beginning, resistance is then understood as, in a sort of Bartleby-esque way, I would prefer not to, or as a form of withdrawal, or disappearance, or, or exit. So I'm wondering, first of all, is your discourse a kind of polemic against that language of resistance? And if, those, if the implications of those kinds of resistance for art practices is fairly clear, and there's a fascination with artists who make disappearance or withdraw a part of their practice, what would be the implications of the notions of will that, that you're holding to? What do you think the implications would be for, for what art is or can do? Well, on the last part, I, I really will I'm going to dodge that question. Because I, for one thing, the idea would be it's really an appeal to artistic freedom, and so it's whatever artists are capable of doing. I have no idea. If I knew what that was, I would do it, right? It's the sort of Bergsonian answer to what's the cinema of the future. And he said, if I had any idea about that, I would make it. Um, well, would so, you be an instrumental art, for example? No, art no, in the I, service of revolution? I don't think so, no. I think art, I, in the same way that what I said was constructivism in the early part of the Russian Revolution and the service of the revolution, it was in one sense, but in another sense it was, as you know very well, it was a, you know, an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily innovative and, and free in many ways. So, and, the, and the moment when that, when that was curtailed, I think, was a, was a real retreat. So, I mean, I, no, I think artistic freedom is its own. It, uh, there'd be a moment when, you know, the line that Castro used early in the revolution was, within the revolution, everything, outside the revolution, nothing. And in the context when within the revolution was in fact a very, a very wide inclusion because it was diverse and eclectic and mobilizing all kinds of national capacities in a really unprecedented way. And outside the revolution meant in practice an allegiance with the United States and with private property and so on. That, that was a slogan that had some polarizing, clarifying effect. But generally speaking, no, I think Artists could be precisely the whole question of what can art do and how can we explore it. And it certainly can do more than just find ways of banishing down its own. How then does art deal with its kind of appropriation 
financialization or commodification of Art, money, it's all and a gesture without withdrawing. Is the problem <coughs> a problem of a sort of missing collectivity or something? Well, why should we expect art to solve those problems? Because those are social problems. The problem, you know, art won't change the mode of production, right? Um, and art can't. So I think um, why, while we're in the mess we're in, educators, artists, what, what can we do? I, I, you, you do the best you can, you clarify things, you provoke, you make people think, and hopefully uh, contribute something to some kind of, collect, you know, some kind of empowerment. That, that, that's what we need. I, I think, though, go back to the beginning of your question, the question of resistance here, absolutely, you know, be right. I think the valorization of resistance with Foucault and all kinds of other thinkers uh, is part of the problem too. And in fact, Foucault is an interesting case that he talked because Foucault's early the work of the early seventies, which I find really very interesting. Some of the, the lectures that have been published, you know, but in the, the Collège de France lectures that Foucault gave, some of the most interesting for me are the, the ones from 72, 73, 74, when he's talking a lot about the will. The first one is all about the will to knowledge in the broadly Nietzschean sense. And then, though, the next couple of sets, of the ones that are on psychiatric power and the abnormal, they're basically about the social, the development of social resources for breaking the will of the people. That's exactly what they're about. The, the, you know, the, the sort of cliche of the, who is the mad person is the person who takes himself to be king, takes himself to be king. And what has happened here in the 1790s is that the people of Paris, basically, the, the people in France, took themselves to be king. They're mad, in other words, and we must crush that. And so the asylum, the psychiatric power, the, all these medical discourses are discourses of power that whose purpose is to overpower the will of the people. And there are phrases in those lectures where Foucault puts it in exactly those terms at times when he's talking to the mouse and he's in fact defending the September massacres, notoriously in 1792, he got himself into some trouble about that. And, and what happens then to Foucault is that as he loses his optimism in a sense over the 70s, he retreats from that and he, his, he ceases to talk about the will except as complicit with power. The voluntary internalization of norms and so on just becomes a, a, one of the vectors of power. And it ceases to have anything apart from this rather nebulous association with resistance. And what is resistance? It's just the flip side of power. It's like this kind of, and, it, it, and it's, it's characterized by its equilibrium. You know, power, resistance, they're there, they balance each other off, you can't really change it. And that is a terrible impasse. I mean, it's a disastrous way, I think, to think about <laughs> power relationships. And the valorization of resistance is the best we can do, in a sense, is I think is selling ourselves very, very short. Uh, and I, I mean, it's, it's a bit awful to refer to the things you've written, but I, I engage at length with a book that I like very much in, in many ways by, by you know, my dear and esteemed colleague, Howard Cago, uh, called on resistance. I don't know if anybody here has read it. And it's a great book. I'd really, I really encourage you to read it. But I, I also, uh, but I basically don't agree with it, and at a, quite a deep level, because in fact, what he does, and I wrote a long review in Radical Philosophy, of, I guess it was a year ago now. Um, because what he does at, at the basic level is he dissociates um, resistance from freedom, you know, from, uh, and that it, if you look at the way he, he grounds the argument, that's that, that's what he does, and it, what it, what it does is it. He, it, what's good about the book is that he says resistance is grounded in the capacity, a capacity to resist, a capacity to resist illness, a capacity to resist psychoanalytic transfer, you know, a capacity to, um, to resist uh, political oppression and so on. But it has a kind of blind, you know, the way Howard frames it, it's not that it's free, it's a bit closer to your question of, of vibrant matter. It's not that it's deliberate and grounded in practical reason and freedom, but more in something like the the fundamental life force, or the energy of a being, a capacity, which is very obscure in my view, and it opens the door to all kinds of uh, problems. Well, so, what about the withdrawal of his attempt to avoid that equilibrium of resistance to power, to sort of try and break it by some kind of withdrawal or disappearance? Well, that has an old history, and that seems like a return to contemplation at best. And if you see that in bits of a gamban, or and I can see that. I mean, the Barbie. I, I, there's something beautiful about the uncompromising quality. I can see why Gamman and Deleuze are fascinated by Bartleby. Um, but it is, it was also like, is that, is that all we're capable of doing? What about, I mean, it wasn't that long ago when you had, let's say, around the national liberation movements, you had the mobilization of artistic capacity in a rather more forceful way than that. And a figure like Sam Ben, for example, uh, in Senegal, or some of the Cuban artists, I think, are worth reading and, and, and looking at, and, uh, or someone like Mohammed Dib in Algeria, or 
Um, I, I don't know, but I, I have to say I was one of the, I was worried about coming in here and someone was going to ask me things about art, and I really don't know. I think <laughs> artists have to prove that. So. Um, well, I had a question kind of that is about music. A few, a few times you said some lyrics that I don't know if you realize. Like, um, oh. Bone Thugs and Farm and Harmony. Harmony, um, Wake Up, like when, when you said that. So I'm just curious, and there's everyday people in the hip hop group, maybe. And, um, I know there are scholars in, that study hip hop or study more, let's say, just in quotes, urban types of music, rebellion, and you know, trance, whatever you want to say, that culture. But I'm just curious if, when you were speaking about the strongest class, um, if there's a way to, if, you know, everyone in a way has to realize that uh, people that are as bright as the lectures we have, that is an academic belief. And what would, what would it, what could it look like if um, there were no, like we weren't specialized in this or that, or, or academic departments weren't as specialized? Because I feel like there's so much similar motivations going on. And so specifically, if every discipline were more like anthropologists insofar as that they really lived, or not lived with, but really befriended, and some people that have had like, overcome certain circumstances they were born into, that you know, nothing to do with morality, free will, it's deeper and higher, lower, everyone, separate from theoretical stuff, and how that can look. And, and I'm, I'm curious, and then I have, I don't know, <laughs> would like to be able to just say briefly how I think it could look after. Okay. And, and hear your opinion. It's really brief. Oh, okay, well, I'm curious. Uh, I am, um, well, I think one of the most interesting experiments, anyway, in terms of what was done, was the Mao's moment. I mean, one of the things that Mao challenges very much in his own his context, and then it's taken up by some of the French enthusiasts, was this idea of the academic distinction, the, the ivory tower, basically, and, and finding ways where you could overcome that and challenge it at every level, uh, which included then <coughs> putting into question the barriers, like who can get into university, where is the university, why is the university here not there, why are academics teaching in these places and not in factories, and so on, what would it mean to establish yourself in, in different places of work, and so on, and, um, and that was something that they pushed very hard, you know, pushed very far, to right to the point of challenging, for example, the distinction between town, the place of learning, so on, and the countryside, and, but, and also the distinction between the old, the educated, the wise, and the young, the impetuous, and so on, so-called, and challenging these things. And the Cultural Revolution, one of the reasons for the amazing enthusiasm behind it, whatever else you think about it, was that that, that tapped into something very real. Um, so I, I, and I think to some extent you could say, although in a very different context, but one of the amazing things about the early years of the Cuban Revolution, and in fact still to this day in Cuba, is this, is the emphasis on popular education, inclusive education, which happened incredibly quickly, you know. To, to go from a, a place where you had illiteracy of 50, 60 percent to eliminating it essentially in the space of a year or two, um, virtually. I, and then to be, still to this day, you know, the Podemos slogan is, if, Cuban slogan, well, much more than it was a kind of Obama reference, and it's all over Latin America because of the Si Puedo or Si Se Puede uh, education motif that, that Cuban educators have been pushing, which is precisely about everyone can do this. Everyone can read. It's also the best bit of, of Rancière's work, is everyone can do what everyone else can do, essentially. Everyone can learn to read, everyone can learn, everyone can learn to write poetry, everyone can learn anything if you have a bit, you have to make choices, you can't actually do everything if time is limited, but in principle, there's no reason why we can't all do what everyone else can do, basically, more or less. Yeah. Anyway, what's your vision? <laughs> okay, I think that we need to kind of get, take a step back from dialogues or de debates that aren't productive and that can look like re redefining words. So, for instance, DIY has been, is not, inherently bad or evil, whatever, but it's clearly been used to sell, like, very, okay, do you know what I mean? Like, it's been co-opted, let's just say that, and by a corporation. 
you know, that, that have maybe you could say incorporated people unwillingly. Without nothing to do with free will, not I'm saying in my opinion literally. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so what about a concept like all acronym based and hopefully <coughs> not just in English, you know, just acronyms that are symbol based eventually. Right. Okay. The other, so what <laughs> backing up. So another acronym that I like to think about is uh, debt, but <coughs> to doing everything by yourself together or doing everything yourself together. But, so just kind of really literally switching little little details and see seeing how that could look and also everyone uh, holding on to each other into each other. And so okay, what about stopping the dialogue? or the debate about the art market and how it, and the branding of the artists and, and, and even the word artist and just thinking about people that like to create or imagine or invent or just, just think outside the box, so to speak. And so how I think that could theoretically look is actively and as consciously and as hard as we can as the people we the people, it doesn't matter who they are, I'm just saying the people that kind of just, whatever you said, have, when it feels real and you can't really, it, abstract words, okay? So literally projecting positivity next to existing systems, like you know, conferences and stuff like South by Southwest, where Twitter was dropped, literally, iCloudly, whatever, and I don't know if that's making sense. So I think that that could look okay. So, and also how that could look is maybe just selling crafts, like, you know, food, the food restaurant in Soho. That uh, was, uh, you know, a, a whole movement. And, and now, like, now sushi's a big, and open air kitchens are, you know, like, have been co opted by franchises. And so, what about defranchising the unenfranchised? I don't know. Makes sense. It might, that was good. But literally projections. And oh, this is the last little part. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about. Or not, <laughs> no, let's recall movements, social movements, political movements, and what if they're fully integrated with the slow food movement, like all of these. The lean, I'm not making fun of the movements. I'm just saying da 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 da. But in really, in reality, a dance movement. Like look at the Macarena and like some cult songs and some <laughs> cheesy lyrics that are saying that like, some pop songs have said uh, words that you said in this lecture and they've been popified in it. So that's what I'm saying. Like like a synesthesia of different academics and Well, I, I, I would say for example that there's absolutely no reason why uh, Basic political understanding has anything to or scholastic about it. Like, why on earth should some some person who has a pretty comfy job teaching philosophy know anything more about politics than anybody else? And there's no reason for that. So that yeah, you, you will find similar kinds of insights all over the place and at every level. <coughs> But did you argue that we have to be in a oh, continuous oh, state? Oh, I'm sorry, I think, because I, I, I know we're <laughs> fish on time. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, though, if you just got to stand there. So I think there's one, sorry to cut you off. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned the four things that will have to do to gain capacity, and I couldn't stop thinking about how those forces exist on both sides, and because they, Let's say when someone, is, uh, when a political movement does gain assembly, it can also gain assembly from the other side, and they kind of neutralize each other. Uh, scapegoating can be used on both sides, for example, or um, the capacity to, uh, or social media, when the discussion starts, these kind of propaganda escalates can be used on both sides, and I think that's what causes the, the fizzle out effect of a movement and it to lose momentum. Uh, I was just wondering how, I don't know, how you could stop that from happening, because I think that's kind of the main cause of why revolutions kind of just, you never hear about them anymore, they just kind of die out. Yeah, but you're talking about happening by winning. 
that time. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, between, you're absolutely right, they have to, and like, the result quote, cool, right, the strong are naturally organized. <coughs> they'll do all those things, absolutely they will, and they'll do it in a very integrated, coordinated, and, and very, very forceful way, and very ruthless way. Um, and that, that's, that's why they are where they are, that's how they got there. And, and that is a, you can be sure of that. So if, I mean, this is a point that Trotsky makes very well, for example, is that if, he says, you know, 1905, 6, if we make some gains, the one thing you know for sure, so let's say we have a little bit more of democratic freedom and we manage, started, for example, to threaten monopolies and, and manage to strengthen unions and so on. So what you know will happen is that there will be a backlash. The backlash, so you, there will be lockouts, unions will be locked out of factories, and, and it's so, sooner or later you'll be drawn to what will be a full-on fight. And that is indeed exactly right, I think. And the question is, who wins the fight? Between, as Mark said, between equal rights, force decides. And the question is, so the way I, the way I see it is a very common understanding of neoliberalism, but it's that it's, it is broadly a class assault undertaken very deliberately it, you know, in all kinds of places, from Chile to the United States to Britain and everywhere else. And that has been very largely successful, so that people resisting it have been defeated again and again and again. Our experience, my experience anyway, has been one of almost uninterrupted defeat. But that's not to say that, therefore, you can infer from that 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 is the story of popular struggle. On the contrary. Um, a lot of the arguments made, I just, I'm remembering this, where, where the other side of this argument was that um, there's a, a saying that says, if you cut the head of a dragon, um, three grow in its place. Um, I think what, uh, obviously what they're referring to with that is that um, once uh, power is <coughs> taken from someone, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a free-for-all. Um, I can't. I I have a hard time imagining that um, our kind of greed and human nature can stop the, the next people in power from um, taking advantage of that situation. Yeah. And I think it's happened a lot to me. Well, but greed and human nature. I mean, human human nature is a very uh, malleable, supple thing. If you look around at the full range of human experience in human cultures, you find lots of societies that are not uh, organized around greed. I mean, so you can't infer much about our particular. Uh, configuration of things, which in the grand scheme of things is still just a, a little bit of your very recent, fragile, precarious thing that's being upheld by great amounts of effort. I mean, the new liberal assault is an assault that's undertaken at huge cost, massive propaganda effort, sustained on a daily basis. I mean, it's no small task. Um, and it has been, there have been, 20th century is still full of extraordinary achievements. And the ongoing mobilization in Latin America, it's okay, there, you can argue that. They're making all kinds of compromises now in Venezuela, and that things are very precarious there. Um, but still, uh, they've, they've achieved a, a great deal in it because of immense amounts of effort and courage and conviction and determination. And there's no reason why the end is written in, in advance. I mean, your question is exactly, again, Rousseau's one. Rousseau is also quite pessimistic about people. And, and he says, it's inevitable. What you can be sure of is that governments will scheme to usurp power. You know, power is in the sovereign. You know, the people are sovereign not because there's a, a thing called sovereignty which then can be vested in a prince or a monarch or, or a, a set of oligarchs or, or people. It's that people have a capacity to pronounce to themselves as a sovereign actor because they have the strength to do it. Essentially, if they're virtuous enough in this term, they can constitute themselves <coughs> as power, as sovereign power, and lay down the law. But that power, then, having done that, requires an agent, an executive, a government, and that government will always, by definition, try to usurp it. And so he says, there's no getting around it. That's just a, that's a fact of life. It will never wither away. And I think he's right. You know, the idea that the state will wither away is an is a Engels fantasy. Um, and that, that, that will never happen. But you can be more or less successful in limit, in controlling the power of the state, in, in actively determining how you're going to do that, how you're going to make the state the servant of the people and not the other way around. And that is something, you know, there's a list of things that Marx applauds about the Paris Commune that, that basically did that, you know, for a couple of months. Um, and that I think has been quite successful, at least to some extent, in parts of Latin America. And there's no reason why. That's not like an unsolvable problem. Of course we can we could do that. If we put our minds to it, if we're determined to do it, if we put in the effort. Uh, anyway, it's fast out to say that. But I, I, I think that's perfectly within our capacity. I'm sort of aware of time to be when I feel like we're, we're sort of sticking a finger in the damn because there's a lot of questions out. I think maybe there is time for one more. There was a couple of hands up at the back before, or um, students want to come to Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, my question relates to this idea of power and how power changes people. And uh, I've uh, done some experiments around this, and I found that a mechanism in which you uh, are uh, of uh, keeping someone conscious of the effects of, of, uh, of how power is changing them uh, kind of creates what is a, kind of a more ethical situation. So, uh, you know, this is like a mechanism which means that the person who has the power is watching themselves at the same time. Is, and they are able to, um, you know, see themselves in this as, a, as, the, uh, as an object in some way. You know, and then uh, you also see, uh, so, um, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what your thoughts are uh, based on that, this idea of the consciousness, the role of consciousness in, 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 in power and how power changes, because power inevitably changes everyone, even the people who start off, as you say, with a, in a revolution, like, in a very idealistic, very ethical way, and then uh, begin to corrupt in some, some fashion. Perhaps, you know, I think of that, although that is familiar phrase, power will corrupt, power will corrupt, absolutely. It's a, it's a liberal cliche that I don't think is always true, far from it, actually. Uh, and that there are, um, there's lots of examples of people who have, I don't, for example, think really Castro has been corrupted by power. You can argue that it's an authoritarian state. It is. It's not, I don't mean that Cuba's got every, has everything right. But that people like Che and Castro, were they really corrupted by power? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there might be some truth to that, but I don't think a huge amount. I think actually one of the things that's striking about them is they're not actually that corrupt. And, and, that they, and the Jacobins were not really corrupt either, but that they were drawn into the, the force of the logic of events over, you know, exceeded their capacity, basically. It was, a, it was literally that. Or that uh, and the same thing happened in, say, the Haitian Revolution, where they, had, they were capable of overcoming colonialism, but the simple, to do what had to be done in that at that time of history, with the resources at their disposal to overcome some other things, they could they just exceed their capacity. But that's different. To be to fail to do something, but to, you know, in the sense of try your best, it's not the same thing as being corrupted. Um, and of course, the history is full of failures, you know, and, and it will always be thus. But so, in the sense, so what? I, they, they, the question of corruption, though, is a real one, and therefore, but you can solve it. You can say, therefore, people should rotate. Nobody should last in position of power for very long. Uh, you should never institutionalize it, so you should desacralize the state in every way possible. You should, you know, it's a cliche, but the notion of public service can be emphasized in ways that, that de-glamorize power. You know, you make sure that no one pay very much. Uh, and that, that, I don't see why that those, those things wouldn't basically solve this problem. I, I was kind of talking more as, uh, sorry, uh, as in this kind of context in which you create mechanisms which actually stop, uh, uh, inhibit power, yeah. which actually starts into a mode. So I don't know how that could be. That might be some kind of ideology, uh, ideological framework or, or something. But it's kind of just this <coughs> consciousness of the emergence of these types of, of uh, uh, power relations yeah. in a situation. Well, it's a good, it's, I, we saw I keep going on about him, but he does talk about this also. Like, what kind of society is such that someone will arrive in a state of emergency, may indeed be a leading figure to accomplish a certain thing, but then when they've done their job, they go back into society as, as an ordinary citizen, and their job is done, and that's it. And then the, the task is taken up by somebody else. And, and that you could valorize that precisely, such that somebody who wanted to be the leading figure on a more lasting basis would be despised as grasping. And, you know, but, Again, it's something that, that's a matter of social institution. There's no reason why we couldn't do that. And that the consciousness and the expanded consciousness and awareness of your position and, and being reminded of that. Again, it's the reason why, for example, Robespierre and Naha emphasized very much the idea of the publicity of public discourse. So when they, they had plans, Naha this kind of crazy plan of the public assembly should be big enough to have 10,000 spectators, you know, so everybody could see and watch, and you would be constantly in the eye of people. So it's <coughs> crucial that there be no place of reserve, that the public debates and so on should happen in public. So even although they're pathetically limited in the end, but the trials for the terror, the great terror, were public events. People could go, they could argue. You know, poor um, Danton, you know, the famous trial of Danton, he's a public event and he's at least able to speak. In fact, he speaks very convincingly. That's very different from the Cheka and Soviet Union where everything happens 
silence and in secrecy. Once you do that, you know, you've opened the door to real disaster. And there's no justification for it. Why should, why should secret political trials happen in places like Guantanamo and other places of absolute secrecy? You know, all the amounts of secrecy and power, the way that the impunity of, of this kind of power, or, or, or the, you know, I don't need to go into what's going on now, but with the drone strikes and so on, the way these decisions are taken, the calculations that, are, that precede them are utterly opaque and, and impenetrable. And that is a recipe for disaster. But there's no reason why it has to be like that. I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm more aware that I've ever been the kind of arbitrariness of these kind of cut off moments, because um, I, I know there's a lot of discuss. I mean, I would just say, um, if you haven't read it, I would really recommend the paper that's still up on the BAE. And I think the seminars on Wednesday are going to be a great chance to kind of hash out some of the issues. There's, there's, I, think, uh, I think a lot of the issues that, we, um, that you've raised tonight are also developed in other ways in, the, in that text. So. Um, uh, thank you very much to Peter, and um, I'm really grateful for trying to go into it.